I've ne we've never seen it do that before. It normally either shatters or it just about holds, but I've never seen a, a holy experiment like this. We're going to show you an organometallic. So organometallic just means that there's carbon bonded to a metal. Our metal today is aluminium, and we're going to take the single simplest carbon-containing unit, which is a methyl group, CH3. So trimethyl aluminium is actually the world's largest tonnage organometallic. It's quite hard to get accurate numbers, but it's at least 10,000 tonnes per year. And you'd think, hey, that's a useful compound. It could, we should be able to do some chemistry with that, both in the lab and on industrial scale. But unfortunately, the compound has one or two uh, problems uh, associated with it. And we're going to show you that by attempting to try and weigh out some trimethyl aluminium in air. So I've got a syringe here, and we've got it contained within this canister. I'm wearing gloves for reasons that will become uh, fairly obvious. So there's going to be a little bit of faffing around here while we get this opened up in a uh, safe way. I'm filling this syringe full of an inert gas. We're using argon today. Argon is completely unreactive. I'll just turn that sound off. So I've flushed the syringe three times with argon, and now that should mean that we can pick up some trimethyl aluminium with comparative safety. So we go down into this canister, and I'm just going to take a, a little bit, and then I'm going to pull this up like so. Now, there may be a slight flame as this comes out the end. There it is. Right. So why can't you weigh out trimethyl aluminium in air? Well, let's have a look. Here's some in air, and as you can see, the compound spontaneously catching fire as we dump it. And in fact, I've put about two grams of trimethyl aluminium there. That's burning with about the same energy as a one bar electric fire at about the same rate. And so you've heard the glass crack there. That's the energy coming out of there. So the trimethyl aluminium uh, has a very weak carbon to aluminium bond. The bonds that aluminium forms with oxygen are incredibly strong. So we're getting a massive transfer of methyl to a burnt flame. And I think if I pick this up, you can see this is now the uh, severely damaged. And that's due to the heat that was merely generated by turning all of those weak carbon-aluminium bonds into really strong carbon-oxygen bonds. So you can see a little bit of aluminium oxide left. That's the same as you would find, I guess, in uh, a variety of uh, grinding powders or indeed in, in common abrasives. It was at the extreme heat when we reached about 500 degrees C, the thermal shock on the gra glass cracked it. So uh, I don't know about you, uh, viewers today, whether you'd like to weigh that out in air without special precautions. Here's the compound uh, in air. We're just going to release this slowly. We're going to see a, a bright yellow flame and oxidation. So going on one, Three, two, one. Okay. Trimethyl aluminium is actually a critical additive in making the polymerization of uh, the monomers that abound in our uh, modern society. So the next time you pick up a plastic shopping bag or a, a, a black refuse sack or a piece of plastic Tupperware, there's a good job that that's come from a catalytic a process that will have involved one of the other metals in the periodic table, titanium, but that will be completely inert until we start to mix in some trimethyl aluminium. So it's what is known as a co-promoter. So if you encounter polypropylene, you can see that on the back of your recycling thing, you'll see PP, there's a good chance that that's come out of an aluminium promoted catalyst. Professor, you just showed me what two grams of it's like. How does industry deal with tons and tons of it? 
Well, you've got to be pretty careful. And you saw that we had a metal canister here. It's sealed, it's under argon. So you need to pipe this liquid around. Uh, you need to build specialist apparatus, specialist plants. And they can cost many millions of euros or pounds or dollars, whatever you would like to put together. Uh, so there's a great lot of this material, but it's remarkably underutilized in many other chemical applications. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have launched the Terrier Oriole. One, zero. One, zero. Launch of the first Terrier Improved Orion. C2 ROA. Out there watching us, let us know uh, if you see it. There's the TMA release on your screen. So about 10 years ago, we set ourselves the challenge of saying, can we develop a stabilized version of trimethyl aluminium that's able to be worked with by a uh, uh, still experienced chemist, but not without the, the uh, rather profound danger that we've already seen. So what we're going to show you now, so an identical watch glass, yeah. Here's our compound that we developed uh, about 10 years ago. This is now marketed commercially. This trimethyl aluminium, so there's the bit we've already seen, and then it's got this diaza bicyclo 222 octane adder. And that's so, so much of a mouthful, we just call this compound dabal, because that's much easier to say. If you remember the flames, you should be worried when I'm going to take the top off here. And I can see a little bit of the fear in your eyes. But if you see here now, well, it's a whole new ball game. Just by making the adduct, instead of having uh, a liquid, we've got a white powder, it's crystalline, it's free flowing. I'm only going to put a little bit down here because I kind of don't want my uh, watch glass to crack. But as you can see, even if you are a, a relatively inexperienced chemist, that's much easier to work with. Now, although this is kinetically stabilized, it's still got all of the potential power to make those very strong aluminium to oxygen bonds. For this one, I'm going to give it a little bit of fuel. So I'm going to cheat by taking a little bit of tissue. This tissue happens to be blue as opposed to your normal white tissue. But I'm going to move that out of the way. And so I guess that looks OK. About a spoonful. I'm going to put it on the paper like so. So again, no major reaction. Thank you, Darren, for that. We need to get just the right of amount of water in it to initiate the reaction. So I'm just putting a few drops. And what I'm hoping is that that will run through the capillary. There you go. So we do get a fire out of it, but I guess you probably could manage with that fire and it's nowhere near the same horrific quantity of uh, energy coming. You can see it getting very hot in the middle. So I strongly advise you to, uh, to not do this on the end of your finger because it would cause severe burns. Three, two, one. And I'll be cleaning Mel's line afterwards. <laughs> So the black soot you can see is actually the uh, carbon that's been produced in the, the flame process. So oh, yeah. we've uh, oxidized up to carbon dioxide, but we've also produced a little bit of graphite there. I, that, that's uh, uh, unusual, actually. I've not th noticed that before. So, but we don't normally spray the stuff around the lab for obvious safety reasons. Yeah, it's all for the aim of science, eh? You just have to clean it up after all this mess.